It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you to make better financial decisions in your life. So some of my favorite stores are in the news right now, and the reports I'm reading, they just don't quite have the story right about dollar stores going out of business, closing locations, raising prices, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to clear up what's really going on and let you know the all-important role that dollar stores can play in your life. Also, if you're looking for a job with some permanence, there's one sector that's hiring for a variety of jobs that you may not even think about. And I'm going to tell you the potential advantages for you of one sector of the economy that job seekers have on ignore. Okay, so I used to love a store called 99 cents only. And this store was based in Southern California, but was in California, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, I'm trying to think where else. And it was started by a family long ago, and they ran the greatest discount stores ever. And then uh, as the family aged, Years ago, probably, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, something like that, they sold out to private equity, and now the chain is defunct. And there were all these news reports all over the country about 99 cent only closing, and Dollar Tree is closing hundreds of locations of their family dollar chain, I think 500 or so or something. And so there were all these stories how the dollar store is, has failed, and the dollar store is over, and blah, blah, blah. And then Dollar Tree, uh, you know, has been experimenting every minimum, everything's $1.25 now. And then they have a section in the store where items can be priced up to $5. They just changed that to up to 7 And so are all these stories saying that, you know, the, that, Dollar Tree is raising prices. That wasn't what happened. So the dollar store thing is still really powerful because there are a lot of people in the country who either are struggling to get by and use Dollar General and the always ailing family dollar and Dollar Tree, and they did use 99 cent only, as a way to stretch the dollar. And then there are others who go there because they like a deal. So people who, who need to be able to buy things at the lowest price possible, and then people who just like to buy things at the lowest price possible. That's why you see what I call the Aldi effect, where you go to an Aldi and you see people who are walking there because they don't have a car riding a bike. You see people in older cars, and then you see people in fancy new cars. Because it attracts people that are price sensitive because they're just trying to get by and people that are just price sensitive. Same thing happens in the dollar stores. Why did 99 cent only fail? Not because their prices were cheap, but because the people who bought them were clueless how to run it. And I used to go to uh, 99 cent only a lot. I haven't been in the last three years because every time I went, it was a disappointment. What the family did that founded it, and when they ran it, is they were the most brilliant buyers of inventory ever. They knew what to buy. In fact, they were such good buyers, they'd buy more stuff that were deals, that were things the market would want, than they could sell in their 300 and something locations that they would then sell them to other retailers and make money on that before those retailers sold the goods. Who else is brilliant like that? TJ Maxx. I don't know if you ever shop in a TJ Maxx. Do you shop Always. in TJ Maxx? I love TJ Maxx and Marshalls. 
And Home C- Goods. And uh, TJ Maxx and Marshall's same parent company. Yeah, and TJ Home Goods X. too. Mm-hmm. Home Goods is too. They have the greatest buyers. They have this sense about what distressed merchandise they should buy that their customers, their target customers, will want to buy. And so they are a brilliant operator. And that's what 99 Cent only was till the new owners who had no idea what to buy. Um, You look at uh, Dollar Tree, when they bought Dollar General, Dollar General had always been a mess. And then they bought it and they weren't able to stop it from being a mess. So finally they're cutting their losses and they've closed so many locations and closed more. There's nothing wrong with the idea of selling things at a price that someone who doesn't have a lot of money can afford. Think about Dollar General. They're still booming. I mean, they're a huge enterprise. And they are not everything's at a fixed price like, you know, at Dollar Tree where almost everything's a buck and a quarter. Dollar 25 tree, as I call it now. So um, there's still a very strong market in the United States for bargains in every category. Clothing is one. I mean, look at the strength of very controversial Xi'an that is absolutely booming in the United States. I saw something recently about the number of downloads by women in the United States of the Xi'an app. I mean, it's a big percent of the women population in the United States have the Xi'an app. And their business model, um, they make the clothes they make, is so far beyond brilliant, it's crazy. Um, You'd have to be into fashion to care about that. I'm just into business, so I've read about it. But it's not just about, uh, there's an old expression, it's not the horse, it's the jockey. Anybody could say, well, I'm gonna sell affordable clothing, or I'm gonna sell items in a discount store really cheap. You gotta know how to operate it. And the idea is not enough. It's all about execution. And there's still going to be plenty of people who want a deal. And deals are not going away. It's just who's going to be selling you the deals that the market share changes over time. All right, we'll go to questions. Renee in Oregon says, my boyfriend and I are about to celebrate our fifth anniversary. We have a 12 year old, we have a 12 year age gap. He's 49, I'm 37. While we are not ready yet, we plan to live together one day, but we're not sure if we will ever ever marry. We had different upbringings, so I am further along in the wealth building journey. I own my home and retirement, and I have retirement savings, but he is much more sensible with his money management. Is there anything you recommend we do differently than other couples or considerations we should take with a bit big life decisions, marriage, insurance, et cetera, because of our age gap? So Renee, you point out something that is so much a part of society now, and that is that the way people couple up the age that they get married, if they get married, it's all different than it used to be. And even people who are uh, getting married at uh, a younger age or getting that younger age is a lot older than it was before, uh, almost a decade older. So people are already out there as adults, they're established, they have their own habits, they have their own money, their own assets, their own debts. So I'm a big fan of you, Renee, and your boyfriend, whatever happens with your relationship, whether it does progress to living together, whether you may or may not someday get married, um, that you have your own separate assets, your own separate funds, your own separate credit. Now, life can be strange and you don't know where you end up and maybe this becomes your life partner. There will be things you'll want to do someday if you end up living together. Maybe you do get married. Um, Even if you don't get married but you choose to live your lives together under one roof, there will be things you want to do to make sure that if one of you is sick, the other has legal rights to be there. Um, You'll want to make sure that you protect each other. I don't know if either of you have kids. Nothing about kids said, right? I don't know if you have kids, um, but each of you would want to make sure you have proper legal documents with wills to protect the interests of the kids or what you'd want to have happen 
if one of you dies before the other. You're not there yet with those questions, but for now, you're still living uh, separate residence, you're living separate lives, but you're each other's boyfriend, girlfriend. So keep those separate financial arrangements. Keep those separate debt obligations. And depending on how the relationship progresses, more things would merge, but you'd still want to keep some separateness financially, simply because the stage of lives you're at when you're moving together and the money and obligations you both already have. Les in Washington says, what happens to a minor's credit freeze when they turn 18? Does it continue or must it be renewed? It does not have to be renewed. It continues as is. What happens, Les, at that point is your minor child who becomes an adult at 18 now has control of their credit freeze. So they can lift it if they need to or they can keep it in place if they wish. The best thing is to keep it in place and only lift, lift a, a temporary thaw when you do need to apply for credit. Jay in Wisconsin says, my girlfriend and I and a dog live in Mil a Milwaukee suburb. I own the house. Nine months ago, we decided to build a new house, which will be ready to move in sometime in May. In the last few weeks, I received a fantastic job of offer in Indianapolis. I wasn't looking, but I know this is this team well. This is a dream job as far as culture, work environment, and pay. The start date is not until early 2025. We're thinking to sell the current house and move into the new house, then sell again after that. My concern is the loss of money on the new house and possible tax I have to pay for living there under two years. What would Clark do? I don't have a tax advisor. I'm wondering if we shouldn't move into the new house at all. If we should move into the new house at all. Are we doomed to lose money on the brand new house? We picked top tier items for almost everything. Isn't it funny when you build a house for yourself, the finishes you may put in a house, uh, the appliances, the countertops are usually going to be fancier than the, than the marketplace would put in if a builder was building a home on speculation. At the same time, somebody who would be buying that home is more excited about being the first time buyer. There's this thing for being a new home buyer that I would think, Jay, uh, is going to be ready in uh, you know just a few weeks. I would consider putting it on the market before you ever move in and see what the market will bear. I would try to sell it first. And by the way, congratulations on the opportunity coming your way in Indianapolis. And I don't know if you're gonna become a Colts fan or you're gonna stay a Loyalist Green Bay Packers fan. But um, I would say the, the proper right move would be to see what you can get for that house. You may be surprised with how strong the housing market has been, you may be able to sell it and not lose any significant amount of money. Uh, you, but it's not going to get better by you living in it now till early next year. I and mean, that's not going to improve the circumstance, especially in the upper Midwest, trying to sell a home in midwinter versus selling in the spring selling season. I think you want to see... Uh, what you can do selling it now because you already have a place that you're living in now and I would try to push it out of your life even though it was your dream home to move into and if you get it sold then you've got the house you've been living in you don't have to move twice you next year uh, get ready to put that one on the market when you do move to Indianapolis now, you've owned a number of homes. You've owned investment properties. You've built homes, too. Would you say anything differently? No. I mean, I think I might. If it's in a, like a builder, there's a builder and there's a new community. It's a new home community. I might talk to the builder. I don't know how much money they put down. But if prices have gone up since they started the process, maybe the builder would be able, willing to make a deal if they think they can make more on the home than what I mean, they were signed is, to them that for. That is very possible because... You said your uh, dream home, your building, and you brought up a point I didn't think about, that they may be doing what they call a modified custom, that it mm -hmm. may be in a development, and uh, thank you, 
and that that home may be one that was built by a builder building production in a development in a neighborhood and they may be the best opportunity potentially if it's your own land you're building your own home with your own contracted builder then everything i said would be true but i love what you said because that really is possible that the builder would want it to market it good idea coming up ahead the job market is so strong i mean the most recent data shocked economists how strong the u.s job market remains one part of the job market people are just overlooking right now because of how strong the job market is i want to tell you an opportunity that could benefit you for years and years to come that most people don't think about do you know that most government jobs that are available are going begging for lack of interest anybody to work in them there are a lot of people who have an uh feeling that they want nothing to do with government so they don't even think about it uh, there are other people who aren't even aware that at the local city county state federal level a lot of jobs are going begging all around the country and many of these jobs maybe even most but not all include something that is as rare as rare could be today and that is a pension you work enough years you're going to have that pension income i mean in the private sector almost nobody i mean really almost nobody has access to a pension and it is a wonderful form of security later in life knowing you have that pension but the jobs also tend to last through thick and thin right now we're in one of the best job markets of my lifetime it's so strong and it's not as crazy frenzied as it was 18 months ago but still the hiring is just crazy i mean we've got layoffs going on as well but the net is a lot of hiring and uh getting a job with your local government or your state or the feds it's a gauntlet it's a process of bureaucracy that turns a lot of people off but the opportunity is there and you know what made me think about talking about this i'd read something about it and then i was driving down an interstate and there were billboards for a local government trying to hire and then i uh, the next day i see a billboard for state jobs state government jobs where the state was trying to hire people i mean this is an area where when government starts putting up billboards begging for workers that tells you something and you know what else i've seen lately as well completely unrelated field hospitals advertising on television and on billboards looking for workers I mean, there are segments of the economy that just cannot get enough workers, which means you have more bargaining power as a potential employee. Just, just an idea, just a thought, because in a medical environment and in a governmental environment, there are all different kinds of jobs and skills that are sought. And a lot of jobs that you do in the private sector have equivalents in both medical and in government that may be an opportunity for you if you feel stalled out where you work or you just don't like where you work krista all right you're, you were on your phone were you uh, trying to get I was, one of those jobs no i was slacking you you with somebody trying to get one of those jobs you were multitasking i was i'm sorry no nothing to be sorry for it was for my job okay <laughs> sean in connecticut says i'm coming up on 60 years old and i'm hoping to retire at 64 my wife and i have been in our condo for nearly three years and owe less than two hundred thousand on our 30-year mortgage which has less than three percent interest rate 
My question is, are we better off trying to pay off the mortgage before retirement or take that money and put it into an investment of some sort at a higher interest rate? Okay, this is wild, Sean. What's the coincidence? Just yesterday, I did an interview where, where the interviewer was asking me all about your question, not yours specifically, but in general, you know, that the advice that I and the classic advice all through the years has been, you want that mortgage paid off before your last day of work. And the, so this was all about what do you do with this anomaly, this odd, odd thing we had following the banking scandals where we went through 10 years of these crazy low mortgage rates that the Federal Reserve engineered. And normally the Federal Reserve has very little influence on mortgage rates, but they did everything they could to get those rates down to reflate the housing market. Now those rates are gone. So here you are sitting with a two point something percent interest rate, four years from retirement, you know the classic answer is you can retire when you have no mortgage. What do you do in this case? You don't pay off your mortgage. Okay, there I said it. <laughs> Can't believe it. Anyway, you don't because if you've got, let's say, 2.78%, 2. 2.75%, 2. Uh, 2.875, whatever it is, your interest rate is so low that you can even out earn it in a savings account and earn five plus percent. So um, if you just think of it that way of the priority of bills, the priority of debts, paying off a mortgage that cheap, you do not want to prepay it and you want to pay as agreed, I can't believe I'm saying it, even in retirement. Mark in Colorado says, I read once that there were some banks that would transfer your existing mortgage balance at the existing rate to a new mortgage if you wanted to sell your house and buy a new one. I called up my lender to ask about it, and they said there's no such thing. It doesn't exist. Was I dreaming? So you weren't dreaming, but what you're interested in is very, very rare. You would have to be with a lender. Usually it'll be a credit union or a small bank particularly banks that specialize in serving the professional market, uh, lawyers, doctors, where they hold loans in what's known as portfolio. All they want is they want, uh, so they're not selling off the loan. Your lender is, is just an originator of loans that they sell off right away. So they have to be what's known as conforming. They have to meet the rules of the uh, federal entities. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. So that loan is secured to that property. That loan dies when you sell that property. On the other hand, with a portfolio lender, um, very small local bank, not one that pretends to be a small local bank, but one that actually is, um, or with, uh, depends on the credit union, if they do portfolio lending, they will substitute different collateral potentially for your existing loan. So this applies to a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of the market and who you used as a lender, which is a pr big production lender, ain't gonna happen, no way. So I'm a little confused. So if I, like say I have, I have a great mortgage rate, right? Are we talking about if I move to another place, I could bring my mortgage with me or are we talking about like, what do we mean? Yeah, so let's say what a portfolio lender is, is they are not selling it off right, I into understand. the mortgage Right, I understand. Like, I market. have one of those. So they're keeping it, and you have a portfolio loan? I do, with a credit union. So that credit union could choose, if they wished, and they're not going to with your loan, because yours is at 1.75%. 875, yeah. 1.875% fixed rate. They're not going to let you make that loan portable at your existing rate. They can mm -hmm. because it's a portfolio loan. They're a portfolio lender. So they can make the loan portable if they wish. They can still make the loan portable, but make the interest rate escalate. Because mm -hmm. they can do whatever they want because they're not having to conform 
with the federal lending rules because they're doing they're keeping the loan in house running the loan in house got it okay. so that's how so if that, you have one of those loans it's worth a shot if you're trying to move and you want to keep your mortgage rate that's what you're right, saying but it's okay. extremely Very rare extremely rare um to have a portfolio lender and also if you've got in your case one point something percent yeah they're not going to be interested Judy in Wyoming says it can really pay off to check online prices versus store prices, even for the same store. I was in the market for dog treats. Walmart usually has the best price, normally three ninety eight a box. This time we were going to be all over town, so I decided to price compare online for the stores in town. I found that PetSmart was having a deal on treats, one box for three ninety nine, but get three boxes and you get one of the boxes half off. Note, I've also compared the price of a jug of treats versus the boxes. And interestingly, the boxes came out cheaper per ounce. So we went into PetSmart and grabbed three boxes. The crazy thing is the price on the shelf was $7.99 a box. Knowing it was lower on the website, I told the cashier I wanted to, the website price and showed her the item on my phone. She didn't bat an eyelash. She knew this was consistently the case. Final twist, five and a half hours later, I checked PetSmart's website again to make sure I was remembering the prices correctly and noticed the price per box had dropped down to three forty nine dollars a box. So, yes, it's true that with stores that are bricks and clicks that you can buy at the dot-com or you can buy in the physical location, that often the dot-com price will be quite a bit cheaper because of who they're competing against in the dot-com environment. You think about um, for them competing against, uh, what's the what's the big online seller of pets? Amazon. Oh, you mean uh, Chewy. Chewy. Someone else also wrote in about Target, by the way, about this. Like, why would they charge me more for store pickup when... I, you know, it's like the same thing they have it in the store. I mean, charge me less to do yeah. in-store pickup right. on the web. It's all because of competition, the people who compare us and shop. Walmart uh, generally will not match in the store when the price is higher on the shelf than what it is on the app. And they'll tell you with a straight face, okay, just order on the app and pick up in the store and you've got the lower price. Obviously, PetSmart has gone a different direction and says you show them the online price They'll match it. But this is a very common occurrence. You never know, though, if the online price is going to be cheaper, in-store price is going to be cheaper. So what I do when I'm in Walmart is when I see something I'm going to buy, I check what's the online price. And then I make my decision how I'm going to buy it. Because I have Walmart Plus. They'll deliver to me for free. So I then buy the... And think of the think of the additional cost to them. But this is the game they want to play. When the price is lower on dot com, I just order it there and I walk away from buying it on the shelf. So this is this is a puzzle. It is a weird game. You won the game, except you lost fifty cents a box, right? Is that what it was? Yeah. Fifty cents a box when the price then went down later. I just did this, I was with my daughter in a clothing store and she found pants and a top she liked, but I looked and I had a coupon, but it only worked for online. So we're sitting in the store and I ordered the items online for in-store pickup and we had to leave. <laughs> and I and had to go back later. a few days later, but it saved us 20%. I mean, Crazy. it really is the pricing games that retailers have to go through because of competition is so amazing and you think about um with walmart how they zone price based on competition the physical location based on who they are competing against around them just like costco does with gasoline do you know costco does that with gas mm -mm. so that's why one costco will have gasoline a lot cheaper than another costco because they do a um commercial perimeter survey so they have an employee either do it online i don't know if they go out and drive around but they price based on the competition immediately in the trading zone around that hmm. store i wonder why because aren't they supposed to be so gas is different from their normal store where it's just a percentage markup yeah so the most they'll mark up is their gas is kirkland signature gas top tier so it's 15 percent. okay but if the market forces around them 
if let's say there's a, a um, Walmart gas or Sam's Club gas or uh, Kroger gas near them that's selling at a really low price, they will lower the price, but the ceiling is the 15%. By the way, I know this is so off topic, but you're obsessed with convenience stores and like fancy new gas stations and convenience stores. I, you've probably seen this, but I was surprised. I saw Sheets when I was on my recent trip, which I know is one of your faves, and it had a drive through You ever seen that? Yeah. Oh. Okay. You know it. I can't put anything to tell you about anything new. No, but it's, a, it's an interesting experiment that Sheets is doing. Those of you from the mid-Atlantic region that are familiar with Sheets, S-H-E-E-T-Z. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's right next to a Wawa, one of your other favorites. Yeah, it's funny that Wawa and Sheets are going head to head now, where they used to avoid each other. Um, it's getting more crowded in the space. So the idea of why you wouldn't do a drive-through is because you want people to come inside and buy more impulse items. But at the same time, they're also competing against fast food uh, places drive-throughs mm -hmm. and most 70 percent of traffic at fast foods now comes through the drive-through so sheets wants to grab that customer as well for mm -hmm. food who might have gone yeah to a fast yeah. food someone doesn't need gas yeah yeah because uh what do you, how are you going to put gas in your electric car yep <laughs> yeah but do you know all the uh Big convenience store chains are popping in electric vehicle chargers mm -hmm. all over the place because the electric vehicle charger customers are there three times the minutes of a gas engine customer. And so they spend a lot more time buying stuff inside the store while the electric vehicle's charging. People figure out how to make money. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> but anyway, enough trivia from I us. I mean, sorry. Because what we're about is save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. And remember, tomorrow, you get to hear how people feel I ripped them off. And Clark stinks. <laughs>